the most beautiful voice I ever heard. Would you be kind enough to read something for me? asked the old man as we hid beneath the overpass. Slowly shaking my seven-year-old head to the affirmative, I watched as he reached down and began rummaging through his dirty old knapsack. I stood silently watching as the elderly hobo began to remove various items from the brown gunny sack he carried over his shoulder. Here it is, Sonny, he yelled out with excitement as he held out both his shaking hands. What is that thing? I, I ain't never seen no kind of paper card like that before and it's got a stamp on it like it's a letter. I inquired. It's called a postcard. I reached out, took the dirty wrinkled postcard from his hand and I carefully looked at both sides inspecting every inch. Taking my time, I inspected every single inch of this strange new item. November 27th, 1951 was stamped across the back and it was covering up part of the writing. Once again, having run away from the orphanage, I had very little choice but to live beneath the railroad overpass. The word about the orphanage was that this was where an abundance of food could always be found. There was a never-ending flow of tramps and hobos, almost on an hourly basis. Can you please read that to me? He asked. You're kind of old, mister. Don't you know how to read nothing? Slowly, the old man lowered his eyes to the ground and hung his head. He folded his hands in front of his body and just stood there not saying a word. I'm sorry if I said something wrong, mister, I mumbled. Raising the card, I began to read the large print. Carl, glad you made it to America. I know you will be a big success in such a wonderful country as America. It is a wonderful place. Love, Minnie. Who's Minnie? I asked the man. She's my sister. She lives in Paris, he told me. I know where that is. It's somewhere over the ocean. Shaking his head back and forth, I watched as tears slowly roll down the old man's dirty cheeks. Thank you for the beans you gave me, mister. That sure was good of you. It sure was, I said as I held the postcard out toward him. Reaching out, he took the dirty postcard and began stuffing it into his torn wool overshirt. I can teach you your ABCs real fast so you can read all by yourself if you want, I told him. Shaking his head no, he turned and walked back over to the large fire barrel and began to warm his hands. The orphanage matrons had always told me that I was not the brightest bulb on the tree. But even considering that, I knew when someone wanted or did not want to talk. Keeping my mouth shut, I walked over to the rusty 55-gallon drum and I just stood there not saying a word trying to warm my hands. Several minutes later, the old man began to sing. I was surprised because it was one of the most beautiful voices I had ever heard in all my life. I had listened to many people sing on the little black and white Zenith television at the orphanage, but nothing I had ever heard was as beautiful as the voice coming out of this dirty old man. Hearing something behind me, I turned around and saw two railroad guards with black jacks in hand running towards us. All at once, they stopped, and they just stood there and listened to the singing. I could tell that they too were amazed by such a wonderful and joyous sound. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. I stood there waiting for the two railroad guards to begin beating the two of us for hiding beneath the railroad overpass. For almost a minute, the two guards didn't move a muscle. Then one of the men tapped the blackjack on the stomach of the other guard and he motioned with his head in a backwards motion. The two of them, shaking their head, began walking away, heading back toward the railroad yard. When the old man stopped singing, I looked over at him and I said, You really need to be on television, mister. Really you do. You're really good. I'll never sing in public again, he replied. Why not? I asked him. I was forced to sing for the Germans and I'll never do that again. I'll never sing in public again. As he spoke, he began to remove his wool shirt. Lying it on the ground, he rolled up his sleeve and held out his arm. On his arm was a large tattoo with a long line of somewhat faded numbers. Why would you put something like that on your arm? Everyone else I know has a picture of an eagle. Once again, tears began to roll down the old man's cheeks. He reached over, picked up his overshirt, 
and stuffed it into his gunny sack. Throwing it over his shoulder, he began walking down the railroad tracks. For more than ten minutes, I stood watching as the old man, who had the most beautiful voice I had ever heard, as he disappeared into the distance.